live. Excellent. <laughs> so we are on, Dr. Hathi. It is so good, my friend, oh, um, to see you. It's so you. great to be with you, Jill. Yeah, and I just love, because we get to talking over a dinner at IFM with friends or wherever we're at, and it's just like boom, boom, boom. You know, like the, the energy and the ideas, they flow. So I actually chose specifically, you're one of my favorite people for that, so that's why oh. you're here. Um, I want to introduce you, and I've got your bio here. I actually, I won't read it all, but I want people to know just a little bit about you, so hopefully I pick the highlights, and then um, we'll just dive right in. So Dr. Hassey is a doctor, teacher, entrepreneur, innovator, and you will see just from today some of his ideas, some of what he's doing. Um, I'm so excited to talk about this because he is on the cutting edge. Um, he's deeply committed to maximizing wellness for everyone. He received his medical training at Vanderbilt and completed his residency in family medicine, just like me, in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. He's board certified in family and integrative holistic medicine. Um, he realized something important was missing early in his clinical practice. And he really, I'll just put it in a nutshell, he's been a real detective in discovering root cause of illness. But what I love about him is he's always, he's such a great businessman and entrepreneur. So he not only takes the ideas of seeing patients in clinic and functional medicine, but he really is going to the next level on creating systems and programs to reverse disease. And we are going to dive into that today. So welcome, Aww. David, to the call today. Um, I love stories. So what I'd love to start with is just a little bit about how did you get interested in medicine? Like you were, where did you grow up, first of all? Where were you born? Yeah, well, I, I grew up, I'm a dairy farm boy from South Dakota. And so I, I grew up on a dairy farm. And uh, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, I was plagued with many small illnesses as a child. So I visited my local family doctor, who is this amazing Filipino general surgeon who took mm -hmm. care of our town of 850 people. Wow. And, uh, and we had a hospital in the town. And, and so I got uh, several thing issues. I had mono that I got to be hospitalized for. Um, and uh, during that time, he gave me a little lecture on immunology and he would come, you teach me, and then he'd quiz me the next day. These are the eras where they'd put you in the hospital for a, for a while. And, and he said, you should be a doctor. And I was like, ah, okay. And then he invited me to come and actually uh, assist him in surgery. So and, you know, here I was, a high school junior with my hands inside uh, another person uh, assisting with you know, cholecystectomies. And... I was like, this is pretty cool. And I also knew that medicine was maybe the one thing I could do the rest of my life and not get bored. So, yeah. <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> that is so cool. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And then, yeah, from there. So, so you kind of knew what age was that, that you kind of thought you were going to go into medicine? Uh, I really, it was in high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mom, mom said it was younger than that, but I don't really have any recall of that. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so this was I. I kind of was a covert pre med during college. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want anybody to know I was pre med because that wasn't uh, I wasn't that nerdy, and uh, so I kind of did that on the sly and and then, uh, uh, but you know, really have loved it. I love the practice of medicine. I mean, it is it is always an opportunity to be humbled and an opportunity to be challenged. So. I couldn't agree more. I love, I grew up on a farm too, as corn and soybeans. And there's something about that, just like, I, I always think of like this nourishment of the earth. And like, for me, there was also toxicity with the environmental chemicals and things, yeah. and this dichotomy and also like, you know, the learning to thrive and grow and the work ethic. And there's something really special about us farm kids. <laughs> well, where, where was that, Jill? Uh, Central Illinois. I was right in Illinois. Right Illinois. Yeah. So did you not know Excellent. that I was a farm girl too? Yeah, I know. No, this, but so this is interesting because I think functional medicine is totally an agricultural model of healthcare. And so allopathic medicine is really more of a militaristic model. So, you know, we, we look at a disease as something to go hunt and kill in, in allopathic medicine. But in functional medicine, we know that it, the creation of health, the growth, the nurturing of our health, health has to be grown. It, 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 it can't be forced. And that's why, you know, the doctor patient relationship has to be sacred because it's the patient that really does all the important work. And, um, and to, if you don't enable that to occur, and I think that's, I think it is part of the mindset uh, that we just grew up seeing things grow on a regular basis. And there's a time for planting. There's a time for cultivating. There's a time for waiting 
a time for harvesting and then a time to rest. And, and, and that cyclicity of, of life uh, just, I think, resonates with what reality is. And when we operate outside of those expectations of, of life and kind of the rules of biology, the rules of reality, uh, that's where we get into trouble. So <laughs> oh, I love that analogy. You know, I've, I haven't thought of it that way, but that makes so much sense. And what I always think about now, my family is still farming in Central Illinois. It's more like an agribusiness because it's grown. And I, I am one of five. I have three brothers. Um, one is an engineer and the other two are farming. But what's interesting to me is my oldest brother has a very good business mind and, and very good detective. And he has gone into soils and soil um, ecology. And he's like a functional medicine like PhD of the soil. And I love it because we get together and have these conversations. And what we realize, I know you understand this better than probably anybody, the soil is a mirror of our gut ecosystem. And if the soil, so a lot of what we see in functional medicine, we see as a mirror of the uh, dis- equilibrium of our soils and the overgrowth of crops and over circulation without adding nutrients back in. It's so parallel. And literally Jeff is a farmer. He has nothing to do with medicine. I'm a medical doctor, have nothing to do with farming. And yet we can have these conversations about calcium pH in this and pH in the soil or about magnesium in the body. And it's so parallel. And it's so interesting to me because the health of the soils and I know when I had cancer at 25, my family started to listen and learn how in the world could Jill have had cancer at 25? And then my sister, David, got cancer at 28. So all of a sudden, there's two girls in this family system that grew up in the same environment. Clearly, genetics had a role, but clearly environment had a role, right? And wow. then my mother had Hashimoto. So there was this whole thing that my family started to pay attention. And now they are some of the only farmers in Illinois that not only are 100% non-GMO, crops with corn and soy, which is kind of unheard of. That's really hard to do. It is. And I mean, this is like 10 plus thousand acres. This is not a small business. And the second thing they're doing is a lot of organic um, uh, plots as well. And again, this is kind of cutting edge for central Illinois farming. So I'm really proud of them for that because that is going to reflect on the health of our nation as farmers do that. It's one system. I mean, we can't, we can't live with the hallucination that somehow we are outside of the entire living system that is our environment. We're part of it, right? And I think, I, think, I think that's just, that is just something that you and I understand deeper than what we could articulate, right? It, okay. it's just, it comes natural, right? Like the understanding well, that, so. you, know, you know I love brain, you know I love brains. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm always, always thinking about brain. And, and you know, the, the, our connectome is the, uh, all of the sum connections in the brain. And we've done, been doing quantitative EEG analysis for like 12 years. And we do a lot of volumetric MRI studies to try to figure out what is the, you know, how is that particular brain not functioning at optimal? And, and when we think of the connectome, it is that uh, we, we, it's a wiring process. When we're really little, you know, the very first steps we take are just all kinds of sprouting going on. Oh, those the first things we see. So the things that happen very young give us the foundation upon which we build the next layer. And then that builds the next layer. And that's why ch early childhood education is so important, you know, all that stuff. But, but our, the way we saw the world it, and the way all of our patients see the world, it's so interesting to go back and so I like the functional medicine timeline. You know, you go back and sometimes how somebody views the world is actually the most important part of their then health care, right? Yeah. So how do you, I mean, that's, I love that perspective. When you're in front of a patient, how do you gather? Like, what's your question for how do you view the world? Because that's a really good place to start. Is there any particular way that you start to get information from them about the view of the world or do you just listen? What's your, what's your secret there? Yeah, you know, I guess it's my gut. I mean, I, I first start with, you know, what is your health for? You know, why do you, why do you want to work together? Because I'm not easy to work with. <laughs> we're going to do a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I were, you know, I do, anyway, the, uh, so what is your health for? And then just in listening, it starts to open up the opportunities to ask questions. You know, my first question is not like, what is your relationship to your mother? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> that would be a little creepy. Right. And, uh, but, but that, that one may come. Right. And you can learn a lot about somebody by their relationship with their mother, because that is the so that is really bedrock when you think of the soil, the layering of our brain and how we view the world, et cetera. So, 
that's my screening question for who I'll date. You know, like, what's your relationship with your mother? Because it tells a lot about how they're going to treat the woman in their life, right? <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot. Oh, exactly. so um, one question before we go to all the stuff you're doing with brain health, I want to talk about that. But we talked about terrain and the soil and how this analogy with farming and that. What do you think? I would love your thoughts about the terrain of our environment and this pandemic that we're experiencing. Mm, because it's mm. relevant, right? Like, how did this happen to us? And what soil did we have that made it happen in this type of extreme? I would love to talk about your thoughts around that because I think there's a lot of things that set us up for this worldwide. Oh man, there's so many things. When you take when you take an ecological perspective of how this emerged and where we went from here, it's massive. I mean, just starting from where this virus probably mutated out of was this really uh, adverse environment of all kinds of animals in very close quarters in high frequency with humans. You just had so many opportunities for cross species jump. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, that is fundamentally where this came from. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, it was our relationship with our food be, uh, being dysfunctional that started this process. And I say we as in yeah. China. <laughs> World, right, yeah. <laughs> it happened. Didn't, that, the virus didn't sprout here. But then I find it really fascinating that this is showing forth so many interesting parts of what we've always talked about in functional yeah. medicine, right? right. It, and, and I wrote this in an early blog, I think like in March 3rd or so. And that, that it, it's the people with inflammation and oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. And if we started looking at our, the viral population with those two markers, I mean, a high ferritin is amazingly predictive of the predilection towards cytokine storm, mm -hmm. right? We have been measuring ferritins yeah. forever, not just to measure iron, but it, we know that that's an acute phase reactant. And it's like, wow, if that's high, you know, and if, even if you just have high iron, that's a problem because yeah. that's going to feed forward oxidative stress. But it's, but those are not measuring the virus. It's not measuring the immune system. It is measuring a marker of how the system itself is functioning. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the huge part here is that we're being invited mm -hmm. to ask questions about the system. And yeah. if we, if we take that invitation, there's a lot of growth that's going to happen as a result of this. If we don't take that invitation, guess what? We're going to have another opportunity to be invited. Absolutely. <laughs> and I love, I don't know where I heard this. This is an original, but it just, I grabbed a hold of it and it made sense to me. Hundreds of years ago, we talked, and even the last decade, we talked about germ theory and like, um, and clearly, I mean, this is valid infections that people didn't even know that washing their hands protected them from these surgeons who were like, you know, taking uh, corpses and then going to do surgery and, and pass an infection. So this is clearly valid, but we need to now move from pure germ theory to um, the theory of terrain, because terrain is all about why are some people having a resilient immune system being around? I heard uh, the story of a close friend who had a friend who who was on the cruise ship and it was a, a husband and wife and their parents for their 50, 50th anniversary. The father died, the mother got very sick, the husband got um, didn't get sick at all and the wife got sick and recovered. So there was these four people, same family, same room, from all ends of the spectrum, from death to no experience. So to me, this going from germ theory and purely thinking about protecting ourselves with a mask and don't go outside. Um, well, there's two sides of that story, right? Because when we don't go outside and don't touch dirt and don't breathe fresh air, our immunity is actually in inhibited because by touching dirt and touching things and kind of our system interacting with the germs in the environment, that's how it's trained. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't follow precautions at all. I'm not that person. But what I'm saying is there's other sides of this and social, social isolation uh, creates its own set of trauma and its own set of immune dysfunction. Yeah. But there's a balance here. And the real issue in functional medicine, which is what we do every day, David, is the terrain, which is, is there an infectious burden? Is there a toxic load? Is there inflammation? Yeah. Because that is going to determine if you get, uh, if you get um, exposed to the virus, there are some people that will not get ill. And we know that mm -hmm. there's some people who will die. So what's the difference? And not, it's not the germ, right? It's the terrain, not the germ. And I love talking about that because that's functional medicine at the core. It's what we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, and it's so interesting. There is no, there's no relevant answer that that allopathic medicine gives for that, right? When, if you're right. limited, so the germ theory is absolutely correct. A hundred percent correct. And there's yeah. more. 
Yes. <laughs> so, but wait, there's more. <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah. No, totally. And I love thinking about that because that's what we deal with every day. To me, as I do, I do a ton of stuff with environmental toxicity. Um, and what I see is the load that we're experiencing, even compared to 20 years ago when I started functional medicine, we'd have someone come in with menopause symptoms or hypothyroid or Hashimoto's or simple, straightforward things that got better. Nowadays, I never, I shouldn't say never, I rarely see something that straightforward. It's layer upon layer upon layer. And the breaking of the system is under the load. And to me, with what I see and teach, a big part of that is our environmental toxic load, the air we breathe, the food that we eat, the water that we drink the stress that we live, these are all burdensome and becoming more so every day so that they break the system internally in our ability to fight infection. Okay, you hold that thought because yes. I have something very interesting to tie into Please. that and start talking about. I, we need to talk about dementia and kind of what I'm doing in that because what you Yeah, let's said, go right into that because that's what I want to really focus on is not what <laughs> I say. You, tell me what you're doing with dementia. Let's just let you dive right in. I really want to hear about this. Okay, well, so let me just say right off the bat, we're literally doing uh, plasma cleanses to, uh, to reverse Alzheimer's. So, I mean, this is just bizarre. I mean, honestly, you sit back and you're like, what the heck is that about? And, um, but no, it's got something called therapeutic plasma exchange. And uh, this is where you have two large IVs put in the arm. Uh, blood is pulled out of one arm, goes in, gets mixed with an anticoagulant. It goes into a big centrifuge that's continuously running. Uh, it pulls off the solid cells and it pulls off the plasma. The plasma, the liquid part of blood, is then discarded. And those solid cells, are, the cells are then mixed with a replacement fluid. And we typically use albumin or, or uh, immunoglobulins, and then that's returned to the body. And so what happens, and this goes on continuously until we exchange, you know, like one to 1.5 times that person's entire plasma okay. volume. So for a guy my size, we'll, we'll run, you know, eight, nine liters of my blood through the machine in a single setting. And it's, so it's a total plasma exchange. I'm, I'm a certified apheresis specialist. So this is, this is not something you can commonly find. Right. <laughs> so this is mostly done in hospitals, but this is a exceedingly safe process. So, but anyway, um, but the whole idea, so I want, I wanted to jump in what we were doing because of what you just said, because you said, Hey, it, it's so environmental. Like all this stuff is environmental. Well, what is the plasma? And this is, this is going to blow your mind, Jill. It's going to hear it first here. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start talking about this, but it's one of the first times I'm really talking about it. Uh, I've been thinking, pondering this. What is the plasma? The plasma is the interface. Yeah between your outside world and your inside world. The plasma is the interface where everything that comes into your gut, yeah. all, the, all the microbiome activities, all the oh, metabolites, yes. all that stuff, mm -hmm. right? That, that the, it's transmitted through the plasma to the brain. How about what the things you breathe? You're talking about what you breathe in. Guess what? You have to go through the plasma to get to the brain. How about what you put on your skin? You have to go through the plasma to get to the brain. And, and so as you know, this entire idea, we, we have so much interest in toxicity in functional medicine because we know it, it just impairs the body's system ability to function. Well, this is literally an oil change. I mean, we're pulling out the old plasma and putting in fresh. Now there's a tremendous amount of science on this, but, uh, Anyway, it, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Let me tell you about the, the major study that supports what I'm doing. So it's a major study called AMBAR trial. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons you may not have heard about it yet is because it hasn't been published. The results have been done for over a year. Mm -hmm. uh, the results have been uh, presented at three major uh, international meetings on apheresis. And it was sponsored by a drug company called Griffles, and they actually make albumin and IgG. Mm -hmm. They're a major pharmaceutical company that takes plasma that people donate, and then they, in the group plasma, it all gets separated into its component parts, and they make bottles of albumin, usually used in the ICU. Anyway, so they, they, they said, hey, you know, this makes sense. They recognize that albumin, albumin in the body is 
one of our major antioxidants. It is actually the major antioxidant in our blood. We talk about glutathione, we talk about uric acid, we talk about, no, it's, it's albumin has the most antioxidant potential of the entire, it's in their bloodstream. And so albumin can get oxidized reversibly or irreversibly. If it's irreversible, that's done, right? It's no longer available to be used. And so there's a difference between the albumin, uh, the albumin that's actually poisoned and uh, irreversibly denatured as a result of toxic intermediation. And, uh, and it's much high, it's higher in individuals who have dementia mm. than people who are normal. And they went, and just hey, to clarify, would that be basically like a sponge or like a neutralizing agent? Is that what you're thinking? When you talk about albumin for the lay person, could they consider it like this neutralizing agent or just a sponge to sop up toxins or, or is it not? Quite yes, good? absolutely. I think a sponge is, is relevant. Uh, I would also kind of think of it more like a Swiffer right? Ah, yeah. you got those little Swiffer pads, mm -hmm. things will stick on and move yeah. on. But every once in a while you get something on a Swiffer and it's never going away. Yeah. Right? And the <laughs> Swiffer is not going to work again. <laughs> got it. Okay. And, and uh, so, yeah, so they did the study and, oh, they, but then they found, looked at the albumin because albumin's in our CSF or cerebrospinal fluid, which is actually the, um, you know, the, the fluid that bathes the brain and which, which has this, uh, carefully guarded interface with the bloodstream and the albumin the albumin in the csf of people with dementia is insanely denatured wow. is super oxidized like like about 40 fold what it is in a an individual without dementia at that same age right so oh my gosh this albumin is a pro the problem let's remove the albumin and put in fresh albumin interesting thought so they did the study and about 490 participants, uh, multi, so multinational, multi-center, many academic institutions involved, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial, uh, doing a plasma, doing plasma exchanges, and there was a total of um, 18 plasma exchanges done over 14 months, and then these, uh, and they tracked them both mild and moderate Alzheimer's disease. Well. The individuals with moderate Alzheimer's disease, so guess what happened over 14 months? Right. What kind of a trajectory change happened when they got these 18 plasma exchanges compared to placebo? Remember, there's a placebo-controlled trial, so we, yeah. we have an idea of what, how, what change do you think happened? Gosh, um, maybe 20% improvement. Would 20% be good? Yeah, 20 would be great. In, in, in the in, world of Alzheimer's? Right, okay. right. Okay, okay. 61% decrease in the rate of progression. Wow. 61% decrease. And I'll, I have these in presentations. I do. Um, Unbelievable. Anyway, so, but, but in mild Alzheimer's, what do you think happened? In mild Alzheimer's, I these people got even better. Right? They got better. They oh improved. <laughs> they improved. Over 14 months, wow. they improved. Now, that's insane, right? Now, it wasn't really powered to give all of the insight that we wanted to do in mild Alzheimer's disease. We, in the group model, it was absolutely clear, so highly statistically significant. Not only that, they did uh, CSF measurements of the amount of phosphorylated tau and amyloid beta-42 in the CSF, and uh, this process stabilized, wow. stabilized the the. Uh, abnormal relationship of these damaged molecules uh, in the uh, in the fluid that was around the brain. Okay, so now it's like, oh, we did plasma just change. Their symptoms, but it, uh, objective data. So you have, you know, that's important. Oh, and but there's more. <laughs> <laughs> but there's more. Is that the um, they actually also did um, PET FDG scans, which measure how much energy how much glucose is being consumed by the brain and uh, what happened is that stabilized as well so compared to placebo mm -hmm. the individuals that had the plasma exchange done had less decline in the metabolic activity of the brain meaning less death of brain cells wow wow and so you said this because the posters presented and what happened with the publishing that's what, what happened with the book. That, that's the right idea, right? Yeah. So, 
So the unfortunate now this is this is just a hypothesis. I don't know why they haven't published yet. And I am so thankful for Griffles for doing this. This is the largest apheresis study that has ever been done in the world. More procedures. Wow. This is a huge investment. I have worlds of respect for Griffles as a company. Okay. So please tell me, let me just say that off the bat. They they went where other people weren't willing to go and they put their money where their mouth was. So hats off. But I think the reason they haven't uh, published is because this was a generic. Wow. So albumin and immunoglobulins, uh, they're kind of generic products. You know, one's not so different from the other supply, one supplier to the next. And so they're making currently and possibly an improved version sure. of, of, of a plasma derivative. So right. when you get the plasma comes in, it's going to be, but it will be a separate drug then that right. will have its own indication for Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. whereas other albumin will not. Yeah. So, but listen, I'm, I'm a certified apheresis specialist. I am, uh, we're, I think it's unethical that we're not doing this at this present time. I think there's enough data. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the risk benefit ratio uh, especially if there's peripheral access uh, for an individual that clearly has Alzheimer's disease or is going down that pathway. Yeah. Um, the, Alzheimer's is a terminal diagnosis. We, right. we see it happening, right? And, and so we're using what is a, uh, an FDA, uh, well, I'm using an FDA certified machine, all FDA uh, certified and uh, approved medications, but just for an off-label purpose. Oh, yeah. So we're not, there, there, there can be no promises made about what actually occurs because we don't have a classic indication yet. Mm -hmm. So this has to be very plain with the people that come in. But, yeah. um, and again, it's, it's how do you see a benefit from this? Now I have seen some cool things happen with apheresis, okay. uh, but it has to do with blood viscosity and uh -huh. uh, things like that. But anyway. Oh, th no, this is so fascinating, Dr. Hassey, because, and I'm curious, like for uh, what kind of, uh, I'm sure right now, this is probably not typically covered by insurance, which is so okay, because the cutting edge things that we do are worth that in, in spades to reverse Alzheimer's, right? And hopefully what you're doing is going to lead the way for the kinds of things that someday may get covered, you know? So I love that. Absolutely. We'll no, yeah. that, no, no, no question. And, yeah. but there's a lot of hurdles that have to be overcome. This is an expensive procedure. It takes a dedicated personnel, a lot yeah. of machinery, a lot of, I mean, it's, it's, anyway, it is hard. I can't even imagine. It is, this, yeah, is not, this is not something that you're going to see pop up in a lot of right. places quickly, and right. it needs to. But that's so great I'm, I'm thing actually, about what you're doing is, like, I love this. I love that you're sharing this, and I love that you're putting yourself out there to really make the difference in these people's lives and to do the work, because a lot of doctors would be too afraid to be the one on the cutting edge, because you are. You're changing medicine. Like, you really are, and I love that. What would, like, a typical patient, uh, how many times would it take for them to, uh, how many times would they need to get um, treated? Until they want their brain to start degenerating again. Oh, okay, so it's kind of an ongoing for those. This is ongoing. And so, there is, and, and that's the challenge. So now let me tell you, the Griffel study didn't do anything of what we do in functional medicine, right? Yeah. Right. So, well, let let me go back. Let me go back to what I said initially, right? That the plasma is the great interface, right? And so we know you and I have both had many cases of patients that come in with a diagnosis of dementia, mm -hmm. and we search for the multiplicity of clues. I've, I've actually created a software database called Maxwell Brain that we're going to be making available to physicians soon uh, that, that takes in all the data, takes in historical data and laboratory data, genetic data, and things like that, and helps mm -hmm. make a, a, a plan. And... Um, and we're working with laboratory companies to actually make this no cost to patients and no cost to doctors so that, and, and I needed this platform for my studies in plasma exchange, because frankly, I need a whole bunch of people out there using the platform to get some benefit because yeah. I think that that needs to be our new standard of care, right? That needs to be our new standard of care. And then we can have something to actually uh, do clear efficacy comparisons on because we, this is, it's, again, it's expensive, it's time consuming, it's just, it needs to become more accessible, but there's a whole lot of hurdles that have to come. And anyway, but, but you got to start somewhere, right? You have to start. And then, and it, once you start, then I love, it. You can I love that you're collecting data too, because that's really how we're going to move functional medicine and what you're doing forward. And I've got a million questions, as you can imagine, like right now, like this is so fascinating. So I'm real familiar with IVIG. I have a lot of patients who get it. 
because of these complex. How would this compare? It sounds like a step above because a lot of the treatment still includes the I, IgG in the plasma exchange, but what would be the difference between a, what you're doing and a typical IgG treatment? Like well, so IgG is you're putting something in, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we should do another whole call. We'll talk about plasma in more depth because I, there's so much more to actually talk about here because, but, but it, it, IgG, you're putting in immunoglobulins. And these plasma exchanges, you're actually removing them. You're removing all the plasma. And, and so what are the typical indications for IVIG? They're severe autoimmune disease, right? That's where well, I was going with this, totally. Guess, guess, what, guess what is the uh, defined standard uh, for the treatment that is utilized when all else fails in autoimmune disease? It's plasma exchange. Oh, exactly, exactly. Plasma exchange. So this is the, this is the, this is the Mac Daddy of therapies for autoimmune disease. So you wanna stop something short, well, let's remove the antibodies. And that works because IVIG, we think that it's actually binding a lot of the excess antibodies and decreasing, decreasing the propensity. But, and, and actually the cost is similar. So mm -hmm. the cost is similar, but the, process, the, the, the availability of somebody who is able to do this and has the equipment to do this is, is it's harder to find than somebody to give IVIG. Finding somebody to give IVIG yeah. is tough too, right? So. Yeah. Now, do uh, I again? I'm real familiar with IVIG, and there's significant side effects with people. A lot of the the, the volume changes and those types of shifts can really cause um, symptoms. And usually, they get better and rate dependent and all that. Is it similar with you as far as the side effects they're watching people, or is it a lot less, a lot more easy for people to tolerate? And so, I've given a fair bit of IVIG as yeah. well in my in my. 20 plus career in functional medicine as well. So we're, we're I, mean, I just love, it's just so much fun know, talking to you, Jill, <laughs> because we just coo, go right there. And you know, there's so many basics that should happen before a lot of things that we're talking about. Right, right. We're, we're I, at I this want, level. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. We, we just gotta, we gotta make sure people recognize that though, because you know, you can get so much done with the fundamentals and those are what you should focus on and do first. But, but IVIG, uh, causes a lot of histamine type reactions, right? There's a lot of immune activation. There's, and you have the volume issues. I mean, yep. in plasma exchange as well, uh, there's a condition called TACO, you know, transfusion associated cardiac overload. Um, yeah. We don't see that because we, we have a, our machine is basically measuring what comes in and out of the body down to about a 10 cc level. So uh -huh. we, we can very tightly uh, control all the fluid volumes coming in and out. Uh, we have a uh, uh, we have a a protocol for preparation for doing plasma exchange that deals with a lot of the excess histamine issues. So we knock on wood, we, we just like don't have a histamine reaction yet. So that and that's really abnormal. I need to publish that as well because the. Um, because when you're pulling things in and out of the blood and you're adding in um, citrate and a lot right. of these other things, you're just, you're just stirring the system up. And, and if your mastocytes are twitchy, then they're going to be angry. Yeah. And, and that you need to calm them down before you start this process. And the nice thing, what we're doing is it's totally elective. It's totally outpatient. We can schedule these things months ahead, get people studied. And, and, and Jill, one of the other things I'm really excited about, I've been doing a lot of transcriptomic analysis. Yeah. And so I actually have before and after transcriptome analysis to take a look at what are the effects of the expression pattern of DNA of the various white blood cells and, wow. and how is that, how is that manifesting in the process? And yeah, anyways, it's, I'm going to be presenting oh, some so of that. At IFM. Fun. We have Wait. to do another call now because okay. this is like, I'm like, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's, well, it's, that's what it's going to take is someone like you who's collecting the data. Well, you have to. I mean, it's one thing to have, we have really good evidence that this is a reasonable thing to do. I mean, in a field where nothing freaking works, yeah. right? For in the conventional world, there's, you know, we, we do, and, but we're treating the plasma, right? When we're, we're optimizing hormones and we're detoxing and we're working with the nutrition and we're changing the, uh, the ketones and, I mean, that's working with the plasma, literally. Yeah. And so, um, but if, I think if we add these two, we can get so much more bang for the buck. I think we can have fewer treatments, fewer plasma exchanges. Uh, I think we can get, you know, I, I have a lot of hope for that. If it's still early, yeah. I mean, I don't want to make any claims. Uh, I, I think the people who engage in this process early 
Uh, my patients are just, you know, incredible contributors to the world uh, yeah. because we, we got to learn it first somewhere. And, and the major academic centers are not going to go here yeah. in the way that we know they need to go there. We, we need to be, just need to be so careful and we need to be you know, humble in this process and make sure that we're loving people as we go through this, this endeavor. So. Oh, I love that. Um, so this is just going out on a limb and uh, we maybe don't have the answer, but I could see this being not just for your patients who are, you know, uh, terminal diagnosis, but I'm assuming someone who wants to be optimal performance, who's young and healthy, this might be really beneficial too, because that's where I'm, my world is like, where are we biohacking optimal performance? And again, this, there's no studies on this, I know, but I'm assuming this would help anyone who has a toxic load um, or who wants better performance uh, potentially. You know, I, I think that's a really good hypothesis right now. I mean, it really is. Um, it, it, it's all about risk benefit. Like right. what, is, what is the potential risk and, and like I said, on a standard plasma exchange, we're, we go through an extensive informed consent process. People have to actually take a test before I will, <laughs> I will see them yeah. because, because we have to have, be realistic about these things. But right. I do think we're going there, Jill. Yeah. I yeah. do think we're going there. And um, like PAN or PANDAS, which is the young people with the severe autoimmune yeah. encephalopathies, those I could again see. We don't know. I know there's no evidence yet, but I could see this potentially being studied in those kinds of patients. No, and, and, and we have people seek us out and ask us questions, and, and it is a, um, we're, if, if people are engaged and, and are open to us gathering the data necessary to track, is this of benefit or is this not of benefit, and, and again, have very clear informed consent, uh, I think that that's a very reasonable path to go down. So then uh, do you have just a couple more minutes? I'll try to wind us down here, but this is so great. I want to ask you, because people are going to be asking you, know, you're there doing this. This is amazing, the work you're doing. It is, hopefully you'll get a Nobel Prize for this someday. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that we need. Um, are you training other physicians yet? Are you are just setting up the data so that we could, where are we at with starting to maybe get other physicians doing this? Is that possible? Yeah, no, no, uh, I, we're not there yet. And, and because the process is, well, COVID threw a whole big uh, monkey wrench in this whole process, like right. it did most everything, because the people who have dementia are going like, I need to stay at home. Right. And now what people are finding out, the people with dementia uh, are, uh, everybody that's close to them is going like, you need help. <laughs> and so exactly. I think we're going to have an explosion of people uh, seeking interest on this. And like I said, I've been, I've just been very quiet, you know, Jill, it, I, like I said, this is my first Facebook live I've ever done. You know, I, I I'm really not out there about telling the story. I want to figure it out. And sure. so yeah. it, I, once the story gets out, I think we're going to have a lot more interest in, I think there's going to be, and, and I love teaching, you know, that's my real favorite thing yeah. to do. And so absolutely we'll be teaching doctors how to do this and how to, yeah. how to get that up and running in their own areas. But apheresis is not something, you know, it is, it's not, it's not something to take, you, you, <laughs> you, you, you can't take a weekend course on this and get started, right? This is not that right. kind of a thing. So. Right. And if anyone is doing it and able to do it right, I just, I kudos to you for being the pioneer out there. <laughs> Um, I am, I know you've got a million things you could be doing instead of talking to me, but I'm really delighted and honored that you took the time. And I want to let people know just if they want to know more about your clinic, want to know more about what you're doing, where can they find you? Tell us about how to find Dr. Hasse. Sure. Well, it's just David Hasse MD on Facebook or David Hasse MD. That's uh, on, I have a website, David MD.com and you can find more information there. Not as much as you need to find, I'm certain, <laughs> but you can ask for more information and we'll start getting it up more. Like I said, this is really the first time I'm talking publicly about this. Um, and I'll be on Dave Asprey on Bulletproof Radio pretty okay. soon talking about this as well. And so anyway, the, and that's, that's one of the best way. My clinic in Nashville is Maxwell Clinic and it's for maximizing wellness. And we've, uh, we're kind of proud to be one of the longest running functional medicine clinics and certainly in the Southeast. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it's a privilege to get to do what we do. We just need a whole lot more doctors doing it. Us and little farm kids who knew, you know, what we're capable of. <laughs> well, we're growing health. Yeah. We no, are. We're, we're, we're literally still back on the farm, Jill. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I am back honored on the farm. to have you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was saying, I'm honored to have you. I'm grateful for your time. I will uh, be sure and share with our colleagues and um, and uh, let me know how I can continue to support you because I'm one of your biggest fans. Oh, thank so. you, Joe. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and thank you for the work you you do such a, a, a you do such a great job of communicating what we are doing and attempting in such a, a high integrity fashion. You know, when there's when there's a lot of people out there doing functional marketing instead of functional medicine, yes. <laughs> right? You know, you, know, the, you know, the people who are making clickbait blogs and, you know, making ridiculous claims and there's a lot of BS. You, you, really, you really stand above everything you put out. I, I'm, uh, I'm thankful for your, your standards. Oh, that means so much. I really, really appreciate it. Well, you enjoy your weekend and thanks for spending time with us here and I'm sure we'll connect soon. All right. Okay, Bye. take care.